This is a topic from AQA A-Level Chemistry Year 13 content. We're looking at transition metals and this is video number two in the series for this topic. I'm going to recommend that throughout you, if you're looking at it for the first time or if you're revising, pause it, have a go at the activities and then review. You get to see what's going well and you get to see what you need to develop a little more. So let's get straight into it. In this particular video, we're going to look at some new terms, ligand, coordinate bonds, coordinate number, maybe not so new. Um, I can explain what bidentate and multidentate ligands are. We can look at the shapes of complex ions, which takes us back to shapes of molecules from the bonding topic. And we're going to look at how charges on ligands determine charge on overall complexes. Got a little tip here, and that is that chlorine atoms are bigger than some of the others for example nitrogen chlorine is in period three that actually becomes really important when we consider um, the shapes of complexes that contain chlorine ligands but we possibly need to look at what that word actually means we've got here um, some keywords and here are the definitions that you're going to need to know and be able to use Transition metal, we spoke about in the last video. It's something that has an incomplete D sublevel in at least one of its ions. A ligand is something that can form a dative covalent bond with a metal ion that sits at the center of a complex. A complex is formed when we take that transition metal ion and surround it by the ligands. However many coordinate bonds there are, that's the coordination number. We're also going to look at acids and bases in the context of Lewis acids and bases. We need to know that a Lewis base is an electron pair donor, as opposed to a Bronsted-Lowry base, which is a proton acceptor, and a Lewis acid, which is an electron pair acceptor, as opposed to a Bronsted-Lowry proton donor. We've then got three more terms here, unidentate, bidentate, and multidentate, and they are they they basically mean how many coordinate bonds can come from one single ligand and we'll talk more about those as the video goes on let's start off with a little bit of a throwback to bonding though have a go at sketching these out make sure you're happy with it dot cross diagrams for water ammonia and a chloride ion so first instance, I've got my H2O, I've got my bonding pairs here, and I've put my electrons straight in. Now oxygen is in group six, six electrons in its outer shell. So I've already used two of them, I've got four to go. I'm going to put those in as two lone pairs there. If I look at nitrogen, nitrogen is in group five, that means it has five electrons in its outer shell. Three of those are going to go into NH bonds, and that leaves two more as a lone pair. And a chloroligand, well, a chlorine atom is a chlorine with seven electrons around it. But this is actually a chloride ion, Cl-, minus, which means there is an extra electron, giving it a full outer shell. So if we then move on to this question, I've put the diagrams on so they can perhaps help you or inspire you to answer. What is it about these that can act as ligands? And what we're really looking at here is that if I just do a little bit of highlighting, they all contain lone pairs. That means they can all they can all provide lone pairs to produce a dative covalent bond. And that's precisely what we're looking at with ligands when they form dative covalent bonds with transition metal ions at the centre of complexes. So they all have a lone pair of electrons. They can all form a dative covalent bond where they are the donors of both electrons. So again, maybe pause, why are they all unidentate? This is an important question because actually you can see that some of them, oxygen for example in water, has got two lone pairs. Chloro or chloride ion has actually got four lone pairs. The thing that you've got to look at is that when you form your bond between, in oxygen's case, the O and the central metal iron, it would not be feasible for the other lone pair, which let's remember, there's a bond angle of 104.5 between them, to actually also form a stable bond. And we can take a look at that by looking at the 
um, actual structure of water. With that repulsion, if I've got a transition metal iron over here and it's bonded via these pair of electrons, this pair of electrons, very difficult to form a bond as well. So it's not possible to form two dative covalent bonds when both lone pairs are on the same atom or iron. Let's take this a step further forward and we can look at the cyanide iron. Based on your knowledge of organic chemistry, have a go at sketching out the dot cross diagram. Well, easiest way, nitrogen is in group 5, carbon is in group 4. You can actually, it's, it's a bit of a leap to jump to the fact there are three pairs of electrons between it, but that's where we end up. And that means that carbon has got one left and nitrogen has got two left. That does now mean the nitrogen has got two, four, six, eight electrons around it, full outer shell. At the moment, carbon only has seven. However, a cyanide ion has a charge of Cn minus. The minus means an extra electron. Let's move on and let's have a go at drawing complexes now. So a copper ion will form a complex with water ligands. It will have a coordination number of six, so that means six coordinate bonds. So what do you think it might look like? Have a go, see how you do. The first thing to think about here is that the <clears throat> octahedral complex um, is going, well, sorry, the six coordinate number means six bonds, and that makes us think octahedral. So I'm going for the octahedral shape that you will know from year 12. And then it's simply a matter of adding my H2Os. Remember, the bond is formed between the copper iron and the O. You'll also notice I've not represented this as a copper iron yet. I've got the O in the right place in every single case there. But each of those waters has no charge. Water is not a charged species. So what we can do is add square brackets around the whole thing. And because copper is plus two and they are all zero, we're actually going to represent the charge as the charge on the entire complex, plus two. There's a very important note just down here, and it was touched on at the start of this video. Um, chloro ligands, Cl minus ions forming data covalent bonds, because the chloride ions are bigger, you can't fit six around them. So any complex that has chlorine or chloro ligands will have a coordination number of four, making it tetrahedral. The other exception to the rule is silver, that silver can only form complexes with two ligands, making them linear with a bond angle of 180. Let's move on and let's take a look at something called bidentate ligands. And to begin with, let's draw out these two compounds based on organic knowledge. 1,2-diamino-ethane, so we know the carbon chain is 2 because it's eth. The amine group, one on the first carbon, one on the second, is NH2, and we fill up the rest with hydrogens. But it does ask you to include lone pairs, and each nitrogen has a lone pair on there. If we do the same with an ethane dioate ion, again, two carbons, remember an ethane dioate ion is what we would make when ethanoic acid or ethane dioic acid has donated both of its H pluses. So we end up with the COO minus on either side. Again, we want to include lone pairs and there are lone pairs on the oxygens. So how could they act as bidentate ligands? What could they do to allow them to form two coordinate bonds? Have a think about it. And let's take a look. I'm going to draw it in a slightly different way. This is now a longer chain, an NCC N chain. And because we've got that flexibility almost, the, the structure can fold around and that would allow both of those pairs of electrons i've taken them off because you shouldn't include the pair of electrons and the coordinate bond and they're going towards the central metal ion so because the lone pairs are on different atoms in the molecule the molecules can change shape bend and fold to allow two bonds to form we actually call these chelating agents, and chelate comes from the Latin for crab-like. Think about the crab claw folding around. 
We can also look at multidentate ligands. So have a look at this and think about how many coordinate bonds you think this substance EDTA could form. What I'm going to do is highlight the lone pairs and they're already in red, but this EDTA will fold around the central ion forming six coordinate bonds. It's still octahedral, still bond angles of 90. The good news is you will not need to be able to draw it, but you do need to be able to look at a diagram of it and recognize where the lone pairs are. So six pairs of electrons can form six bonds. If we take a look at heme, uh, and that is something that may be familiar to you, but will become more familiar, I hope, um, that is something that involves complexes. You can see that we have got iron, and that's surrounded by four coordinate bonds here. We've got something called globin. And in fact, actual fact, these ends are all on one species. So there are four bonds on the same one. We've then got something called globin at the top, and that's giving you a little bit of a clue. We've got heme and we've got globin. Now, the water molecule down at the bottom here, when we get oxygen breathed in, takes the place of that. And that is then carried to cells in the body where respiration can take place. And just so you can see here, actually, those ends I was talking about, the porphyrin ring has been simplified. But you can see here how there is one large ligand with those four ends with four lone pairs. As we move further down, you can see that the O2, it can actually be replaced by a CO2, and that's how the carbon dioxide from respiration is carried back. But it can also be the case that carbon monoxide can take the place of the O2. The question down at the bottom, carbon monoxide is toxic. Why is that? Well, it's because this re reaction is irreversible. So once we get a CO bonded to this complex within hemoglobin within the red blood cells that bond will not break that essentially means that that red blood cell can never carry oxygen again and if you get enough red blood cells with carbon monoxide there what you're going to find is that you are essentially going to suffocate you're not getting oxygen going to the cells so it's really quite dangerous really quite toxic Let's take a look at this, linking complex ions with entropy. Have a think about this, and we'll take a look at the answer in a second. So we've got our coordinate number six. We've got six waters around the copper, the copper plus two. And if we add EDTA, we end up with our multidentate ligand, one of them, replacing 6H2O. So why would delta G be less than zero? And why is this reaction feasible? So we're making cross links here with a thermodynamics topic as well. First thing to notice is that there is an increase in the number of moles. It's not just a small increase. We're going from one complex and one EDTA to one complex and six water. That means there's a large increase, two to seven. That means there's a large increase in entropy. If we then consider Gibbs free energy, delta G is delta H take T delta s my delta s t delta s sorry is going to be high because there's going to be a large increase in entropy and that that for that therefore means that you're likely to see that delta g is below zero and remember that delta g must be below zero or less than or equal to zero for a reaction to be feasible so there we have the reasons why Let's take a look at this question, see what you think. So a charge on a complex ion is the same as the charge on the central metal ion. What does that tell us about the ligands? In really simple terms, the ligands must have no charge. And there are examples here that we've already seen within this video. Water does not have a charge. So I surround a central metal ion with six waters, the overall complex will have the same charge. I can do the same with NH3 ligands. So what about if the overall charge is different? There's hopefully a logical response here. We would expect that the ligands do have a charge. And one example that we've seen already here is a Cl- ion. So if I had a copper 2 
iron and I surrounded it with four chloro ligands, four Cl minus ions, my overall charge would be the plus two of the metal iron and the four minus ones, an overall charge of minus two. Just to finish off, a little bit on optical isomerism and a very specific example here. What would the two different optical isomers of PT, NH32, Cl2 look like? Now, what we're going to find here is that we have got either the two NH3s are on opposite sides to each other and the two chloros are on opposite sides to each other, or perhaps the two NH3s are near to each other and the two CLs are near to each other. Now this might be making you think of EZ isomerism, but we actually use a different term here. Uh, and we're going to use cis and trans. Now, when we talk about something being cis, and this is platin, so on the right hand side, it's cis platin. It means that the two that are similar are together. They're next to each other. But when we look at trans platin, they are on opposite sides to each other. And final question, uses for one or both of these isomers. And what we're looking at here is that cisplatin is actually used as an anti-cancer drug. Going to finish off with one final task. This is going back to a bidentate complex, a bidentate ligand complex, I should say. What would the optical isomer of this be? And I would always recommend actually draw out the mirror line and then you simply draw the mirror image. So I've put in here my structure and from there I can now start to add in all of my bidentate ligands. You can see the mirror image with these two facing each other and... Just take that one out and we have got optical isomers. So that takes us to the end of part two. Uh, thank you for listening and goodbye.